So the Romans, would, when they would conquer a region, they would send in an ecclesia to govern it, led by an apostle. That was the term. And they were assigned not only to govern that region, but the Romans knew if we don't change the way they think, if we allow them for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years to keep thinking like Persians, for example, one of these days they're going to want to rebel. They're going to want that identity back. Say, we, we, we're Persians, and so they'll, they'll fight us. But if we can change the way they think through education, culture, family, government, if we can change the way they think until they finally are happy saying, I'm a Roman, then our kingdom will last. So the term for that was discipling. So they said, Ecclesia is in, led by an apostle, to disciple nations. To think like Rome. So when Jesus came along and he restored the mandate, he said, I've come to get the family back. And now I've restored the, this authority, this governmental concept of stewarding the earth. Then he, before he left, gave us the Great Commission. Only we've called it the Great Commission, but he really didn't give us a Great Commission. He gave us two Great Commissions. And what, really when he did it, they were two recommissions. Because in Mark 16, he said, this is my paraphrase. Now, I've done everything I need to do. I've, I've, I've reestablished the family. Now, you're going to go multiply again. So go into all the world, preach the gospel, and you went down the list. And you're going to get them born again, filled with the Spirit. You're going to cast out all the demons. You're going to get them healthy. And now go do it. Reproduce. But in Matthew 28, it wasn't about oikos, get the family ba uh, back. Matthew 28 was all about discipling nations. So he said in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of the nations. And if you have a translation, and I'm not you know, trying to be mean, but if you have a translation that says go and make disciples, as in people, one at a time, that's not a good translation. But our faith, a lot of people, you know, you know uh, it, it, it's hard to, it's a lot easier to translate it that way than to believe he may have really said, I want you to go disciple nations. But that's what Jesus said, go disciple nations, because you're my ecclesia. And you're going to go in with apostolic authority and wisdom. You're going to disciple those nations for me after they come into the family, the kingdom of Rome, I mean the kingdom of heaven. And you're going to, you're responsible to make them think like heaven. If you don't do that, If you're limited in your understanding to only half of the assignment, you get people saved, but you don't transform earth. So you can experience, for example, what is perhaps in scope and numbers at least the greatest revival in history called the charismatic movement. And many scholars would say as many as 50 million people were saved in the charismatic movement. And in America, it swept through this nation and millions of people came into the kingdom of God and the Jesus people movement, the, the youth came in and, and it, was, it, was, it, was, it was incredible. But how do you have the greatest outpouring of Holy Spirit in history 
And when the dust settles, you have lost ground. How does that happen? When a decade or two have gone by, you have lost education. He lost the government. He lost the media. Because our mindset, our understanding was just get them ready for heaven, get them saved, get them in the family. And we didn't, if we, if we stepped into Matthew 28 at all, it was just to say we have to disciple this person that came into the family here. We couldn't get our arms around mountains, culture, society. And in the charismatic movement, and I'm not going to get off on um, eschatology because I don't know enough about it, but but I will say this, our eschatology in the charismatic movement, which I was a part of, which it was my eschatology too, was basically... It doesn't, none of that stuff matters anyway because it's all going to get worse and worse and it's all evil and Jesus is coming so soon it won't matter anyway. So the, so the, the buzzword of the movement was Maranatha, the Lord cometh. The first Christian movie was The Thief in the Night about the rapture. The best-selling book was The Late Great Planet Earth and the most popular songs were Soon and Very Soon We're Going to See the King. <laughs> The whole movement was built around, let's get out of here. And so there was no, there was no vision. There was no theology anyway for, for thinking in an apostolic sense of discipling nations and a mandate to do that. And so we lost a lot of ground. What's beautiful is that what is coming is so strong. Good, what's the good thing coming, God, what God's about to do, is so strong. And the outpouring of his spirit is going to be so profound. And so many millions of people are going to be swept into the kingdom from every mountain, from every walk of life, from government, business, media, campuses, kids, young, old, black, white, Latino, Asian, American. They're all, there's, this, there's this deluge of revival coming. There's a rushing mighty wind on steroids that is coming into this nation and the nations of the earth. And we are going to be more positioned than we've ever been in history to transform nations almost overnight. Because we understand his authority now. And we understand that we don't have to dictate to people and try to rule by force. We change the heart and God does something then and all of a sudden they didn't care yesterday but today they want to know what God thinks. And they start loving the Bible. And I, I become convinced one of the things that happens when people get born again is just common sense goes to another level. I mean, you don't need a lot of you don't need a lot of revelation to you know the boys and the girls ought to be in different bathrooms. It's common sense, you know. I mean, but I mean, you just when Holy Spirit takes up residence here. You start thinking differently. We, just for the sake of, of teaching and understanding this, I call Mark 16 awakening or revival. When that happens with a lot of momentum, I call Matthew 28 reformation or transformation. It doesn't matter to me what you call them. That's just, those terms work for me. Okay. So, the reason I said that is to say, we, we have had a, a movement now, that's, not, that's too strong a word, we have had teaching 
that has been of the Spirit for 10, 15 years now saying transformation, mountains, culture, society. Let me just tell you, we have had no ability to do that. That's just Holy Spirit preparing the way. And we sing, take our cities and this and that. We haven't taken one yet. We haven't transformed a mountain yet. But we haven't had the ability to do that because when things get so far down this road of heresy and secularism and humanism and atheism and they've taken over the institutions and media and government and, 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 and... and, and, and now you've indoctrinated, you've got a 40-year a generation, 40 years, that's all they've known. And you, you, we, we have not, it would have been impossible to have brought the level of transformation and change that we've been teaching and preaching. Thank God for the Lance Wall now and anybody else that's carried that message. It would have been impossible up to now to do that. And Holy Spirit knew that. He's just preparing the way. He's planting the seeds so that when Mark 16 starts to happen, the church is ready now with an apostolic company of nation builders that can step in and say, we know what to do in government. We know what to do in education, media, business. We'll show you the principles of the kingdom and how they work in life. And there are going to be millions of people that say, somebody tell me what God thinks about this. 